The dawn of digital publishing was met with a great deal of fear and apprehension by many in the publishing community. But there was one woman who took writers and publishers by the hand and led them gently into this new world. If you want to make sense of what's happened in the digital publishing world, and perhaps more importantly, what's going to happen, she's someone you really need to listen to. You'll get that chance today on Disruptor. From the edges of publishing, it's Disruptor, celebrating the rebels, mavericks, and weirdos of the publishing industry and encouraging each of you to disrupt in your own way. Now, here's your host, John Bard. Greetings, everybody. Welcome to Disruptor, Episode 8 with Jane Friedman. I've been in the publishing world for close to 30 years. And I've seen a lot of things change, but maybe they haven't changed fast enough. And so I asked the question, are there disruptors out there? Are there people and companies that are really changing things in publishing, pushing us into the future, throwing out the old rule book and creating a new one all their own? I went in search of that and I found them. And every week here on Disruptor, you'll meet them. Welcome to the journey. It's time to disrupt. Today's episode of Disruptor is brought to you by Writing Blueprints, the breakthrough step-by-step system for writers that creates truly great books. To learn more about the most disruptive way ever to become a successful author, visit writingblueprints.com and use the code DISRUPT to save 10% off everything on the site. The writing world has been shaken. Meet the earthquake. Go to writingblueprints.com and use the code DISRUPT to save 10%. Writing Blueprints. This is how you write a book. For more than 20 years, while many in the book world fretted or even panicked about the impact of digital publishing, there was one calm but very insistent voice telling writers and publishers something very different. That publishing in the digital age was a time of great opportunity and was nothing to be feared. She's backed it up with two decades of great work. She's the co-founder of The Hot Sheet, the essential industry newsletter for authors, the author of The Business of Being a Writer, and the Author's Guild Guide to e-publishing. In addition, she's a columnist for Publishers Weekly and a professor with The Great Courses. And she's somebody who, when you want to know what's about to happen in the world of digital publishing, you get in touch with. And that's exactly what I did when I spoke with Jane Friedman. Welcome, Jane. It is, uh, it's, re- it's really a thrill to have you. As you know, I've, I've been following you for a long time and an admirer of yours, and I'm amazed by your energy and the, the range of things that you've done. And I want to start with this question. We here at uh, Disruptor celebrate the rebels, mavericks, and weirdos of the publishing world. Which one of those words best fits you and why? I'm going to say rebel because whatever community that I find myself in, I tend to push the narrative they don't want to hear. <laughs> so I, I, for, as an example, when I joined the Virginia Quarterly Review, it's a very literary publication. It's run by a university, very storied, very concerned with image. And when I entered into that environment, I felt like they brought me on knowing that I was very progressive in my thinking about digital media, audience engagement, cultivating a readership. But for those who know anything about literary journals, they're terrified of anything that would be seen as catering to the reader. Uh, So in that environment, I never gave up on my efforts to try and push the journal in a more reader-focused direction. Not at the expense of quality, of course, but to be more friendly and open and engaging. Now, conversely, when I find myself, let's say, in a self-publishing or indie environment, which tends to be full of very progressive entrepreneurial folks, I'm probably the first person to pipe up about the value of traditional publishing and why you shouldn't immediately throw it out of, out of, um, out of consideration. So I'm always trying to push people's buttons, but in a, like, in a way that forces them to maybe apply more critical thought. Um, to what they're doing and why they're doing it. This is one of the reasons why I think you are a particularly disruptive disruptor. (laughs) 
<laughs> because you don't seem like a disruptor. Because yeah. whatever group you seem to work with, you're one of them. But pushing them in different directions, as yes. opposed to uh, an ideologue or, or you know, someone who's a polemicist who just says, this is what I believe, come with me. And I find in a lot of ways, you, you make greater change. And tell me if I'm, if I'm right, you make greater change by sort of being among all the groups and pulling them in a certain direction. I like being a bridge. I like trying to explain the merits and values of something that may be foreign to the group that I'm in. Uh, so I, and I've seen, and I, you know, it's fascinating to me the tensions that occur across various communities. Like when I was at Writer's Digest magazine, there was an internal tension between those people who had more of a focus and interest in literary publishing and those who were more interested in commercial, as well as the difference between self-publishing and traditional publishing. And I found that when I started, I was lowest on the totem pole because I was the expert on self-publishing. So that the, there's a lot of status anxiety that comes, that applies to all humankind. But in the writing and publishing environment in particular, I find that a lot of times people's concern about status um, is driving their choices. And I think that's one of the reasons I really like picking at people's <laughs> um, beliefs and value systems, because sometimes they're making the wrong decisions for their career. Right. So that's actually one of the weird things about publishing is this idea of cons of people feeling like they need approval from somewhere else to walk the path. You know, if I'm opening up a dry cleaners, I'm, I'm not waiting for some dry cleaning gatekeeper to say, yes, you can do this. <laughs> And nobody's looking down on me because I'm not part of a big national chain or anything. I'm just cleaning clothes, right? But publishing has this history with it, at, which seems now really almost to be in direct conflict with the writer-entrepreneur concept that, that has developed over the years. And frankly, sometimes it seems like it's just a giant mess, right? Mm -hmm. How do you, when you're talking to newer writers or any writer who's trying to get that foothold, how do you walk them through that? If they can be pinned down on it, I ask what their goals are. What is it they want to get out of the process? What does success look like to them? Um, but that, that's just kind of the opening salvo. Like often people aren't willing to admit right away what they actually want. So when you try to put some concrete details on what success looks like, if I say, is it is it financial? Is it number of copies sold? Is it seeing your book on shelves? You know, once you get highly specific, people are usually willing to, like a, here, a concrete example would be someone says, well, I just want to see the book published. I just want to have it in my hands. But if you dig a little deeper, you realize the real answer is they want to see it on a store shelf. That's what's going to validate them. So when I'm walking people through that, I try to get at what's most important to them? What is it? What's the outcome? Even if it is status related, doesn't matter to me. Because if it like if they if the only thing that's going to satisfy them, for example, is seeing their book on a Barnes and Noble shelf in their town, well, I know that there are certain paths that they probably shouldn't pursue. If you were a writer in the 1950s, you didn't have that ability to say, well, I would just like to see my book on a Bookshelf, basically, unless you're working for a very literary press or some, you know, educational type thing. The goal was to be among the relatively few books published and to sell a lot of books. But now, because it's sort of this choose your own adventure thing, it's great for the individual author. But is it good for publishing when you suddenly have all of these people who are simply saying, well, I just want to have a book that exists and that's great, but then there are millions of books that exist and we can't find the good ones. I mean, does that become almost too much? I tend, tend to be an optimist on this front where I, I, don't, I don't, there's no question there's like a deluge of content out there, but we've felt that way at almost every period in publishing history. Like when the printing press arrived and there were all of these books, people worried that no one would read the classics and when there was more commercial uh, literature being published, like ghost stories and mysteries, when there was the emergence of a middle class, and so you had more light entertainment 
coming onto the market, people worried about poetry and if, how it would survive. And so there's always been this anxiety surrounding there's too much out there and not all of it is, is good. And I just don't buy into that pollution model. I think that we generally are now more than ever able to find exactly what suits our tastes. And I try to leave the value judgments out of it. Mm -hmm. So there is no question there's a discoverability problem for new authors and it affects publishers the same as it does a self-publishing author. So you just have to be really determined and also honest about who is it that you can realistically reach and how can you describe your work so that they understand this is for them. When we started Children's Book Insider in 1990, the publishing process was relatively straightforward. You sent your manuscript off to an editor somewhere and hoped for the best. And then maybe a couple of years later, your book shows up somewhere. And it was almost like, uh, it, was a, it was a meritocracy, certainly, but it was a clear path. Then suddenly choices started appearing to the point where it seems like everything is just, to a lot of writers, this mist of choices. One of the things that you're known for is sort of guiding people through this mist. Where do you start with someone like that? Where do you start with someone who's just overwhelmed by what's happening by technology? They maybe aren't technologically inclined. They're fearful. Where do you start? I first point out that the traditional publishing model is still there and available and is not dead. <laughs> and it's, it offers certain pros and cons. For someone who really is, feels lost and like they want some hand-holding, they want the experience of being published, I usually steer them towards the traditional agent query route and trying to get a traditional publisher. If the person I'm talking to though is just wondering about how can I best get my book to market? Like there, I, see, there, I see so many service companies and I see lots of publishers out there and it's really hard for me to differentiate between all of these services and, and publishers of various types. Then I try to get a sense of, do they already reach their audience? Like, are, is this a business person who's basically looking for a business card? Are they already speaking? Do they already know their, their target really well? Or is this someone who really doesn't yet have a clue and has not an entrepreneurial bone in their body. <laughs> so trying to figure out the person's sense of publishing already and then the readership they're trying to reach that helps me get them on one path or another. I think sometimes it's easy for me to pigeonhole people in one of two ways. It's not necessarily fair. However, there are the people who want what I referred to as the experience of being published. They want to be edited and they want to go through the design and they want to feel like they're being taken care of. And other people just see it as more, much more pragmatically. They just want to get the book out. And so what's the best way to do that given their goals? A lot of writers are introverts and very self-conscious, very fearful of, of criticism, of, of just putting themselves out there. For those folks, is, is there hope beyond traditional publishing? Can someone like that be brought into the more rough and tumble world of the author entrepreneur? <laughs> I don't think introverts have anything to fear from entrepreneurship or self-publishing or anything related to building a business as an author. I consider myself an introvert. And I think that the way the industry has changed and the, ch and the changes wrought by digital media have made it more possible than ever for introverts to flourish because you can control more of the engagement. You decide when, how, and where you're showing up for how much time. You know, I agreed to this interview with you. You didn't put me on the spot at a conference. Mm -hmm. um, I'm doing it within the comfort of my office. <laughs> so like there's so many variables that introverts can now control and you can also decide how to market in a way that befits your strength. So social media, even though it, I think, I don't think it's an extrovert's tool. It's just that it's often misused in a way that's associated with extroverted behavior. Mm -hmm. So when you look at what social media, how it actually works, you see that the more you demonstrate 
curiosity and interest in people and in the world, the more successful you are with it. Introverts excel at demonstrating curiosity in other people because they're trying to de deflect attention away from them. So when we look at how businesses get built over the long term, I think introverts are perfectly situated to make that happen because first, they're going to be controlling the terms of engagement, and second, because they um, are focusing outward, if they're doing it well. What are the skills that a burgeoning author entrepreneur should be developing? You know, we talked about that mist. So you can focus on so many things. You could focus on emerging technology. You could focus on marketing. Of course, you have to focus on your craft and, and so on. But what are some of the, the core things that anyone who wants to move forward in publishing right now needs to have? I think early on you need to figure out what team is going to be helping you because self-publishing is a misnomer in some regard. You can't do it well without the help of some professionals. Most people are not expert editors, designers, production people, copywriters, sales and marketing folk. So you need others. And I think there's a process you have to go through to identify who you're going to work well with. So, and, and also figuring out what help you actually need. So there's that piece. Then there's laying the groundwork for your online presence. And I think there are generally three pieces to that that are not negotiable. There is the website, your author website, there is some sort of email marketing component, and then probably one social media site that you show up consistently. And so there's a digital literacy that goes, that surrounds that. And the more you've already been active online for a number of years, using social media in some regard, I think the more you can kind of ramp up and be a little bit more strategic in your choices and how you're showing up over time. If you've totally avoided social media and been living in a cave, <laughs> if, you've, if you've somehow stayed off email and never received a marketing message, it's going to take some time. Um, but usually once you start paying attention to how those people you admire, the ones who have like kind of already made it, they're already uh, off and away on, on, you know, in the depths of their author entrepreneur career, if you, you can start stealing some of their best practices and figuring out your own methods of engaging your readership and growing. There's two, speaking very broadly from what I've seen, there's two ways that authors use social media. One is to promote a book. The other is to build a following and create connection among potential readers. And I always tell people the latter is the one that, that's going to work. People don't respond simply when you throw up a copy of your book on Facebook and say, buy it now, 99 cents, right? Is that still the model? Is it still about building um, a following, building a community, connecting with people who are on your wavelength? I think build a following is sometimes, even though that's what is happening, I think that's an, an intimidating prospect for okay. people who either don't like social media or just don't understand why people would follow them. <laughs> okay. okay. Especially like, so let's back up for a moment. Why might people follow you? Well, probably because they've read your work or experienced something that you shared or did, like maybe they met you at a conference. So all of the engagement that you have typically has to grow out of some body of work you're producing in order to be valuable to you on a career level. Um, but if we just, if we, if we strip away that strategic part, I think social media, basic, basic, is just about making impressions over a series of time so that people don't forget you exist <laughs> and they start to associate you with a certain voice or with certain issues. So I think sometimes this gets broken down into a formula. Like you're gonna talk about these three things all the time. It's gonna be bourbon, cats, and um, books. <laughs> and you're never going to deviate. Like sometimes people want that sort of tactical advice with that so that they know exactly what they're going to do. But I think if you're showing up as yourself rather than as a marketer, you're naturally going to gravitate towards certain things again and again. So I think that's really all social media is, is becoming associated with certain things over time and people remembering you when, or recognizing you as the case may be when there's an opportunity. We're starting to see a lot of book deals 
come out of Twitter, particularly in the political realm, people that have been, um, you know, out there and talking about things that are going on, building that following, being kind of sage wisdom in little 280 mm -hmm. uh, character bites. And now you're starting to see book deals come out of that because from a publisher standpoint, if you have 500,000 followers yes. and you release a book into that, <laughs> it makes a lot of sense. So uh, I think that's absolutely true. Um, let's, let's change gears a little bit and talk about the arc of publishing. We'll get into what's, hap what's gonna come in a minute, but in terms of what's happened since you've been following, you've been doing this for 20 years and following what's happening. Is there anything that surprised you about a technology that either you thought would happen but didn't or a technology that, su that surprised you? I thought we were gonna see a lot more from app-driven reading that was beyond just like a serial. So right now, if you think about how we read an app form, it's either your traditional ebook, like a, through the Kindle app, or if it's a little more exciting, it's like a Wattpad sort of app. So you're reading serialized something or other. There's some other like, uh, like more professional iterations of that, like Serial Box or um, Radish, Tapas. But you know, they're kind of a lot of these presentations are what I consider more on the fringe. Like there's not that many people. It's not like a mass right. medium as of yet, ex unless you look maybe at Wattpad. So I remember this has been back in 2012. There was an app called the silent history that was a serialized story. It got pushed out over the course of maybe six months, maybe longer. And it was truly, it felt innovative and special. And I thought there would be so much more to come out of that, more stories like that. I also remember an interactive novel. It, was, it wasn't exactly a choose your own adventure, um, but it had that kind of aspect to it. And it was a, like a dystopian future. It would have done really well today. I think maybe <laughs> for the reasons that didn't take off, it was too soon for the time. And now we're in the dystopian present. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I, that was another model. Well, I thought this, this could take off, this could inspire so many other things, but neither of those, like, when I talk about them now, no one knows what in the world they are. Like the, it's just the silent history. No one's heard of it. Um, it feels like it reached a very small group of people. So I thought that I, ha I hesitate to call it like enhanced eBooks because they weren't eBooks. Um, it wasn't necessarily interactive literature, but it was this, it was taking the novel to another place that was fascinating. And I hope that it comes back eventually. And then during that same period, one of the things that certainly surprised me, and here we are now part of it, is audio becoming mm -hmm. such a significant player because it's such an old school technology, if you will. I mean, what, what we're doing today, we could have been doing on the radio 50 years ago. Yeah. And yet there it is. And so maybe is it, is it about a case of sometimes the technology doesn't match what readers want? Yeah, I, I mean, the audio books... That's not something I could have predicted because I'm not a consumer of audio myself. Right. I don't listen to podcasts. I was never a big radio listener. So to me, I just, I missed, I missed that coming. Right. <laughs> it, but given the iPhone and how we now, like, if you, if you look closely, yes, the signs were there, but yeah. Does it tell you anything about the way people want to consume stories? Because it, one of the, to go back to the, the serialized things, I think about the fact that we live in a binge society, right? If you want to, Netflix puts on a show, you could sit there and watch the entire thing all the way through. Maybe people don't want things meted out. Yeah. Yeah, I do think we like the binging. And when I did some research recently for my newsletter on audio, one phenomenon I came across is that people who are like really into audiobooks who, listen, who are high volume listeners, they're looking for series. They're looking for things that can, they can really get lost in. Um, and so that, which is no different from me when I'm looking for a Netflix series, right. you know? So it's pretty interesting. What's, let's, let's look toward the next five years. What do you think is, is gonna happen? Take your best shot. <laughs> and we'll come back five years from now and see how you Oh, do. goodness. Um, well, to go back to Wattpad, I've had so much fun watching the evolution of that company, uh, which was founded before the Kindle in 2006. 
And last week they announced they're going to do some premium forms of content the first time that they've ever charged for something on the site because it's 100% free. Uh, they do have some ads. So where is that going to go? And is that going, like, is that going to um, grow and become more interesting over time? I, I hope so. I'm seeing a lot of younger writers who like to go there and basically learn how to write in front of an audience. You know, they're not going off into their garret by themselves mm -hmm. to write. They're doing it. They're improving as they go and publishing along the way. So I, I would expect Wattpad to be more, maybe more of an influence, more of a place that new writers go and maybe producing stories that are along the lines of what I want to see more of, like the silent history, mm -hmm. I hope. There's probably going to be a big four instead of a big five publisher right. uh, environment. Right. I, I've, consolidation has been predicted for a while now, but I, it feels like in the next five years that that could happen. Uh, Amazon, I, I feel like everyone's waiting for the shoe to drop on the self-publishing side where they somehow tighten the screws on self-publishing authors. And that could take the shape of reducing royalties if you're not exclusive to them or um, reducing royalties more generally because they did that with Audible and audiobooks uh, some years ago. So mm -hmm. why not on eBooks? Mm -hmm. So the, I, maybe I'll limit myself to those two things. Those are the things I, I watch avidly to, you know, always watching where the wind's blowing. Okay. For the folks who want to see where the wind is blowing, who want to, start really getting digging into the to what's happening and staying on top of trends obviously i'm going to suggest that people follow you and we'll have your information in the show notes who are some other folks or, or, or entities that people should be paying attention to who are you know really good about bringing you up to speed on, on what's going on well aside from looking at all the usual trade publication suspects just for trends um like publishers weekly and the bookseller and so on um when Mike Shatskin writes something, I always pay attention. He does a, a blog uh, at his website. He's kind of in a semi-retirement, so he's not writing as often as he used to, but he talks to a lot of the, the big players in New York. And so I feel like when he says something about what's happening in traditional publishing, I'm definitely going to pay attention. Um, on the digital marketing end, I always follow Pete McCarthy because he... Uh, worked for the big five, then went entrepreneurial, and now is in Ingram. And I feel like he's always been on the cusp of what's happening on discoverability issues with books, both print and ebook. Uh, he doesn't blog anymore, but he will occasionally be on a panel at a conference. Um, and so you might see him surface, and he, he has a good Twitter feed that you can follow, so you can kind of see what he's thinking about. Um, Thad McElroy has uh, a blog called The Future of Publishing. He will occasionally do a deep dive on some issues and research things that no one else is looking at. And looking at bloggers, um, Joanna Penn has a podcast as well that she's often interviewing people in the industry and people who are experts on very niche topics like Facebook advertising. So from like a tactical nuts and bolts standpoint, She's excellent for the indie author crowd. Great, great. What's your advice to someone who wants to disrupt? <laughs> Ignore status <laughs> and, and focus instead on, uh, on what, what drives you innately to, to be in this business of writing and publishing. I find that this is an industry that because there's not a whole lot of profit margin on the books themselves, it tends to draw people who are less focused on money and more focused on accomplishing something fairly ambitious. Uh, and so focus on what that is rather than on trying to impress a particular agent or a particular publisher or a particular group of people. Great advice. One last question for you. Who's your favorite disruptor in history? Could be dead or alive in any, world, any area of the world. I think I'm going to go with a contemporary choice. Alan de Botton is a UK author who has this very classical education in philosophy. And for anyone who knows anything about academic, <laughs> academic people in 
in philosophy departments. Um, they do not kind of look on the business world with anything but disdain. So Alan de Botton wrote a novel and then he wrote a range of books that are basically self-help books, like How Proust Can Change Your Life or The Consolations of Philosophy. He's like a pop philosopher. Mm -hmm. To me, that's such a daring move for someone who knew he would lose respect for writing for a general audience. And then, beating that even, he launched something called The School of Life, which is based in the UK, but now has little outcroppings. And it's a business. It's a business that helps people improve their lives through the application of philosophy. And to me, that is incredibly daring and is not what you would expect from someone with his background. Oh. He, it reminds me of one of my favorite disruptors, Carl Sagan, who took a lot of heat for taking cosmology to the people. Yeah. But that's an that's a incredibly noble thing to do. So yes. noble choice, noble choice. Well, this has been great. Uh, thank you so much. We'll regroup in five years and see how you did. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and, uh, and again, everybody, if you are interested uh, at all in what's happening in the future of publishing and the present of publishing, you need to follow Jane Friedman. Thank you so much, Jane. Thank you, John. Today's episode of Disruptor was brought to you by Writing Blueprints, the breakthrough step-by-step -step system for writers that creates truly great books. To learn more about the most disruptive way ever to become a successful author, visit writingblueprints.com and use the code disrupt to save 10% off everything on the site. The writing world has been shaken. Meet the earthquake. Go to writingblueprints.com and use the code disrupt to save 10%. Writing Blueprints. This is how you write a book. For show notes and videos, go to disruptcast.online. And to start a disruption of your own, visit writingblueprints.com to discover the most innovative and coolest way ever to write a great book. We'll be back next week. Until then, go forth and disrupt.